you so much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to Sarah Gomez for and, and the Environmental Studies Program for the opportunity um, to talk about the Pacific. Um, and thank you all for your interest in the Pacific. So I want to get right into it because I've got a paper that I'm going to sort of read from. It's a script in a way. Um, so I'm trained in history. And, and for those of you that are trained in history, you know that we often tend to read papers. That's a little bit different than other disciplines. Um, but there is a bit of information here that I want to get through. Um, really quickly, though, I lived in Hawaii. I went to UH. Uh, I, I taught elementary school there for a while. I did research. I then lived in Southeast Asia for a few years, in Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And so I sort of accumulated all these different interests and experiences. But now it's time to really sort of hone in on a, on a PhD project. And that's, that's kind of the backstory on that. For me, though, growing up in the Bay Area, living in Hawaii, following the ocean to, to Southeast Asia, it's always been about the ocean and the marine environment. That's kind of really what I'm keen on. So <clears throat> I'm going to get started. So on August 25th, 2016, the National Park Service turned 100 years old. The very next day, on the eve of the World Conservation Congress in Honolulu, um, President Obama made history by signing a proclamation uh, expanding the size of the Hawaiian archipelago's Papahanaumokuaea National Marine Monument. At nearly 600,000 square miles, this ocean reserve became the largest marine protected area in the world. And so this is a picture of it here. So a quick, and I'll get to the history of it, but basically it was created by Bush in 06, enlarged by Obama in 16, and, and in all likelihood threatened by Trump today. And, and that's essentially where it is, right there. So, and yet, while we know how the protected geography came to be, um, we know far less about the ways in which the U.S. came to understand and value the Pacific's biological diversity. In teasing out one thread of what is a much, much wider story, this talk uses the career of Alvin Seal, um, whose dates are 1871 to 1958, to show how the overlooked study of fish was central to bringing the ocean ashore and knowing up close the wealth and wonders of the Pacific environment. Through Seal's currents in and around this great ocean, um, the talk suggests that today's National Marine Monuments and other spaces like them not only stem from the historical interplay between fish science and infrastructure, but that the legacy of these interactions is also, more importantly, at the heart of knowing these Pacific waters and the threats they face in the age of climate change. So here's the Pacific. This is kind of Seals Pacific. This was a map made by a Spaniard named um, Father Alguille, who was a meteorologist in Manila. Uh, it, was, it was made in 1898. Um, so the Philippines are right there. Uh, and this is more or less the space in which Seal traveled during his sort of career. And this will be the space that I'm talking about today. So in the early 20th century, no ichthyologist, so that's someone who studied fish ichthyology, no ichthyologist did more to popularize or produce knowledge about Pacific fish and the seas from which they came um, than the American naturalist Alvin Seal. From 1904 to 1941, he built a network of public aquariums that stretched across the Pacific from San Francisco to Manila. Within this oceanic circuit, seal exchanged tropical fish and introduced foreign species. In Hawaii, for example, he imported mosquito fish um, as part of an effective anti-malaria campaign. This was in 1905. He, in fact, went to Galveston, Texas, collect the, collected the minnows, the mosquito fish, and carried them in these milk jugs all the way to Honolulu and then released them in the uh, in the Alawai, in the kind of water canals where, where mosquitoes were, were, um, were breeding. In Manila, he introduced black bass, common carp, and rainbow trout as new food sources. But Seal's influence and legacy extended much further, reaching far beyond Honolulu, Manila, and San Francisco. His work stimulated the rise of public aquariums in South and Southeast Asia, serving as a model for institutions in Batavia, which is Jakarta, Colombo in, in Sri Lanka, Bangkok, and Singapore. In particular, his sense of design and use of technology 
accentuated the aesthetics of Pacific fish and thus maximized their public reception. As an ichthyologist, Steele applied his knowledge of fish diversity and aquatic environments to assemble spectacles of marine life, thereby producing valuable, if not baseline, knowledge about Pacific waters at a time when urban, political, and social change were in full swing. So the first part, I'm going to talk about sort of what's Seal's story, what's, what's the background, before we get to the three sites in which he, he does his work. And those three sites are Honolulu, Manila, and San Francisco. But first, sort of, what's his backstory? What's his training? While well, Seal's story comes to a close in 1958, at the age of 87 in the comforts of a Santa Cruz home overlooking the Pacific, it opens like many other turn-of-the-century Californians, from far away. Still was born in Fairmont, Indiana in 1871 and raised on a farm as a Quaker. His outdoor surroundings likely sparked his interest in zoology um, that he then pursued um, at Stanford University. In his memoirs, Still recounts, quote, pedaling down the long, dusty road, walking up long hills, riding through streets of Indianapolis, St. Louis, Denver, viewing for the first time the vast prairies and high mountains of the far west. So he bicycled from Indiana to San Francisco, or to Palo Alto. It took him three months. It was a chance encounter with David Starr Jordan. Anybody know who David Starr Jordan is? That's great. So David Starr Jordan is the president, founding president of Stanford, but before and, before and probably more importantly than that, he was a really famous American ichthyologist, and he sort of shaped a whole generation of ichthyologists who, who study Pacific fish. So it was a chance encounter with David Starr Jordan, the famed American ichthyologist that not only brought Seal to the ocean, but also set in motion his life aquatic. He had attended a lecture given by Jordan when he was president of Indiana University. Jordan told a small gathering of students, quote, go wherever the masters are in whatever department you wish to study. For Seal, the department was, was zoology, and so he went to study with Jordan at Stanford. As his mentor, Jordan was not only a professor, but he was also president of the newly opened university. Um, while courses were important, Jordan's professional network seemed to serve a more critical role in shaping SEAL's aquatic life and expertise. At the end of his first year in 1892, he got a summer job at Stanford's newly established Hopkins Seaside Laboratory in Pacific Grove, California, one of the earliest marine stations on the Pacific coast. So this is a, a picture of, of um, the students at the Hopkins Seaside Laboratory. And um, two quick things about this laboratory, well, three, but one quick thing, it's created um, just four years after Woods Hole, which is kind of the, 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 the real important one that, that most people think about. But this is right around the same time but this is focused on the Pacific. Secondly, what do you notice in that picture other than those two dudes sitting on the top? What, what stands out a bit? This is, these are scientists, 1892. Yeah? Incredible diversity, men and women. That's right, men, exactly, men and women, yeah. So marine biology in the late 19th century was one of the few sort of tracks possibly available or open to women. So lots of women, not just in the US, but in the Netherlands, in France, um, women became marine biologists. This was a sort of scientific route for them. Um, the third thing, Pacific Grove, where this was located, seals sort of circled at this time and, and later in the 30s with John Steinbeck and Ed Ricketts. Anybody know who Ricketts and... You know who John Steinbeck is, right? So Ricketts and Steinbeck... Ricketts was a marine biologist who was trained at Chicago who went out to Pacific Grove, created a company called... Um, Pacific Marine Laboratories, and basically what he did was he collected specimens and sold them to museums and universities. So he made money that way. But there's a book, two books. One book, Cannery Row, that Steinbeck wrote. If you know that book, the character in there, Doc, that character is, is modeled after Ed Ricketts. And then secondly, the, the Log of the Sea of Cortez. This was a joint expedition that Ricketts and Steinbeck had taken to the Sea of Cortez in California. Anyways, the three of them, Ricketts, Steinbeck, and Steele, were all in Pacific Grove at around the same time. Okay, Steele spent a summer rowing a boat here at the Seaside Laboratory. Steele spent a summer rowing a boat 
collecting birds, and preserving specimens for the naturalist Leverett Millis Loomis. Um, Loomis is a huge figure, so this was just like a super nice chance encounter. Um, Loomis would later become president of the California Academy of Sciences, which is a really important institution. Um, once the summer was over, Still used his skills and experience to make his own collection of bird specimens that he then sold to museums and colleges, much like Ricketts would do in the 30s. The money earned that he earned, that is Seal, paid for his Stanford education and partly financed a trip to Alaska and the Arctic region. Seal's time at Stanford coincided with a period of political change in the Pacific. Um, on a typical schedule, Seal should have graduated in 1896, but he didn't. He graduated in 1905, um, nearly 13 years after he entered the zoology program. But the late 19th and early 10th uh, early 20th century was in flux. Empires were rising and falling, and technologies were connecting the world through cable and steam. For Jordan and Seal, these rhythms and ruptures created new opportunities for scientific work and for popularizing the marine environment. Through one of Jordan's connections, Seal was appointed curator of fish at the Bishop Museum in 1899, positioning Seal to make Hawaii the first site in his network of public aquariums. Almost immediately, Seal was sent on an expedition to the South Seas to forge scientific connections and build up the museum's fish collection. Although the institution was founded in 1888, Seal's expedition was the first of its kind for the Bishop Museum. <clears throat> the itinerary included stops across a string of coral islands, Tahiti and the Society Islands, the Austral Islands, the Gambier Islands, the Cook Islands, Guam, Samoa, and the Solomons. Oh, that's a terrible picture of, of him collecting stuff. This, these photos, some of these photos are from his, his, um, his archive, which is at Stanford. Um, on visiting Guam and Samoa in 1900, Sill conducted the first zoological surveys of these newly acquired American colonial territories. So in 1898, the U.S. annexed uh, Guam, Samoa, Hawaii, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. They all became sort of insular territories. <clears throat> in Guam, he observed a, quote, fishing fiesta, end quote. The Spanish had banned this collective fishing practice that used a poison made from the juice of a futu tree um, in 1894 because they feared it was depleting the waters. But with the advent of Mary American colonial rule, this law was considered obsolete. After witnessing a fishing fiesta, Seal was concerned about the, quote, whole destruction of fish and thought the colonial government should disallow such practices. His account documents the scale of capture and raises concerns about its long-term impact. Um, now, I'll quote him really quick. Fully 700 people took part in this fishing fiesta, an immense deep pool several hundred feet across a short distance inside the reef was surrounded by a line of seams, or kind of nets. At low tide, about one barrel of this poisonous juice was poured into the pool. The effect was almost instantaneous. Hundreds of fish came gasping and struggling to the top of the water where they were captured and killed by the natives. No ill effects seemed to follow the eating of these poisoned fish. Thousands of small fish were killed, and that's really important for reproductive purposes. There we go. His South Seas expedition lasted until 1903, resulting in a collection of almost 1,600 fish specimens, representing 375 different species and nearly 125 species new to science. So that's an example of one of the ones he did. This is another. Um, quickly, I'll point out, so there's two names here, Block and Schneider. Those are the people who first described that fish. So that's not one that he introduced to science. Neither is this one, but this one is. And this is a, a parrot fish. So you'll see Jordan and seal. And type, that's really important, um, because that means that's it there. This is at the Smithsonian, where they have the actual fish sort of scanned. Um, type is kind of the, 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 the original principle kind of specimen used. Um, and all of the fish that seal collected during his expedition to Guam, Samoa, and, and the South Pacific were all sent to Hawaii and then later transferred to the Smithsonian. 
where one can now go study them if, if they wish. By 1904, um, Steele was recognized as the leading authority on the equatorial Pacific because he knew more about its, quote, fishes and fisheries than anyone else in the United States, end quote. Building on his ichthyological knowledge, expedi expeditionary experience, and professional authority, still began to lay the foundation for a public aquarium in Honolulu. He had significantly increased the size and popularity of the Bishop Museum's fish holdings and through his collecting work in the South Pacific and around the Hawaiian archipelago. So this is a picture of the Hawaiian, uh, of the Honolulu Aquarium. With growing scientific public and commercial interest in the territory's fish fauna, still worked with the Cook and Castle families to open the Honolulu Aquarium in 1904. As curator of fish at the museum, he knew which species would not only thrive in saltwater captivity, but also present well to popularize the tropicality of Pacific fish. So the aesthetics of the fish, that's also very key. Based on his work keeping fish alive at the museum, still advised on the design of tanks and the aquarium circulating water system, both of which were critical for the entire enterprise. To secure a fresh supply of seawater, still recommended that the aquarium be located at the water's edge of Waikiki Beach. The Honolulu Aquarium opened with 265 fish, representing 60 species. As one reporter observed on its grand unveiling, quote, such an institution as the aquarium was for education as well as entertainment, end quote. So it's located, in fact, there's still, the aquarium is still there. If you've gone to Waikiki Beach, it's near San Susi, which is kind of on your way to Diamond Head, but right in front of um, the zoo. So if you follow the zoo to the ocean, you'll see there's a building there and a natatorium. That's where the aquarium still is. But the Honolulu Aquarium, this is an interior shot. Um, the tanks were sort of around the, the edge here. <coughs> The Honolulu Aquarium was more than a place for education and entertainment. It was also a mark of empire and the power of this empire to exhibit the brilliance of ocean life. By 1898, the occupation of Samoa and the acquisition of the Spanish Empire had placed large sections of the Pacific under American colonial rule. Tropical fish from these seas and their, quote, beautiful coral gardens, end quote, were secured and put on display, as were fine examples of Hawaii's piscatorial tribes. That's a quote, quote. One fish that grew great attention was the surge wrasse, um, locally known as olani in Hawaiian, and found among, among local reefs. This popular attraction was especially, quote, blue with a beak like a parrot, end quote. Amassing and assembling a collection of tropical fish and keeping these fish not only alive, but also healthy and attractive, were signs of the ocean's evolving place in projections of American empire. On a visit to the Honolulu Aquarium in 1905, David Starr Jordan, at the time now president of the University of Stanford, but also um, of the California Academy of Sciences, he declared it had, quote, the finest collection of fish in the world, end quote, noting that he had seen all the famous collections. Another visitor to the aquarium, Sidney Mbalo, who was a Hawaiian Supreme Court justice, added on his tour of the saltwater tanks, quote, this beats the aquarium at Naples. They have no such collection of fish as this. They attributed to the Pacific, to, to the rich diversity, but also the colors and the aesthetics of the fish of the Pacific. For Jordan Mbalo, tropical fish figured within the modernity of a society and the position of that society within the modern world. In this way, public aquariums were places for education and entertainment, but there were also metaphors of empire and projections of imperial expansion and projects of imperial expansion. From Honolulu, Steele followed the currents of empire to the Philippines in 1907, where he was charged with organizing a division of fisheries for the new colonial government. Like the mosquito fish, he introduced to Hawaii, still brought to import, still sought to import rainbow trout and black bass into these faraway imperial waters. Crossing the Pacific for about a month en route to Manila, he managed to keep most of the bass and trout alive. In need of cold streams, he proceeded north to Baguio City, a colonial hill station planned by the Chicago-based architect Daniel Burnham. With its cool temperature and mountain springs, Steele released the trout into one of Baguio's brooks and he planted the bass at Trinidad Lake. 
The Basque, in particular, took well to their new environment, become an becoming an important food source for the peoples of Mountain Province. Bearing fish as he disembarked in Manila reflected the nature of Steele's aquatic life and the kind of career he would have in the Philippines. After his detour to Baguio, Steele focused on cataloging the available commercial fish in Greater Manila. He visited popular fish markets in Tondo, Marikina, and Divisoria. He made lists of types and prices as well as collected specimens for his new office. Much like he did in Hawaii, Guam, and Samoa, still interacted with vendors, retailers, and consumers to learn about where these fish came from, how best to preserve them and prepare them, and their local names. During his first few months in the Philippines, Seal also made excursions to nearby towns and distant waters where he sought to better understand the colony's fish fauna. He traveled to Laguna Bay, a body of water not far from Manila, that was checkered with corals, sort of fish pens and fish ponds. With the use of a coast guard cut, uh, with the use of a coast guard cutter, still explored the Sulu, Sulawesi, and Visayan seas, and in the process collected fish, fish knowledge, and fishing appliances. So here's an example. He was down in, in Palawan, which is a big island south of Manila, um, in the Mindoro Sea, which kind of is on the edge of the Sulu Sea in the southern Philippines. As Seal's collection of fish grew, so did the challenge of identifying them. Because of the scale of his fish collecting, space within this small office at the Bureau of Science was no longer tenable. It became imperative for Steele to push for a public aquarium in Manila that would serve the interests of science, commerce, and society through one institution. Paul Casper Freer was equally committed to the idea of a public aquarium. As the founding director of the Bureau of Science, Freer was invested in seal, his ichthyological research, and the new work of the, the Division of Fisheries. Freer used his close personal relationship with Dean Worcester, the Secretary of the Interior in the Philippines, to secure a space for seal in the USS Albatross in 1907. And the Albatross was a, quote, floating laboratory that was conducting the first comprehensive survey of Philippine marine fauna. For Freer and seal, the development of an aquarium was necessary to making the ocean public in the area of colonial urbanization. By bringing the sea to the city, Freer aimed to create a place for foreign scientists, grade school students, the Japanese Navy, which visited quite often, and others to forge new types of understandings about and interactions with the Philippine marine environment. To this end, Manila's cosmopolitan nature fostered a modern world that was interested personally and professionally in Pacific waters and how these waters provided the colony its basic protein and offered it a wealth of economic resources and scientific specimens. Freer envisioned that the aquarium would become a complex with a central library and marine collections, and these facilities would form the basis for scientific, for scientists, staff, and others to work at materials as they came in. Following the suggestions made by Sill, who had pursued ichthyological work in Sindakan, which is uh, on the island of Borneo, and Batavia in the Netherlands Indies in 1908, Freer also proposed to Worcester that the public aquarium include, quote, laboratories for marine biological investigation, much like Batavia's Pasar Ikan in, the, in, the, in, in colonial Indonesia. Pasar Ikan is it's this fish market in Malay. Um, so here's the aquarium, and you can see some, how it's built there in, in the wall, and I'll say a few words about the wall. It's kind of, a, it's kind of amazing. On June 24, 1910, Seal received a message from Cameron Forbes Governor General of the Philippine Islands, and Forbes is from Harvard. He's from a very, very wealthy family, uh, a Boston family that was involved in trading with Calcutta in the, in the 19th century. Anyways, he becomes Governor General of the Philippines in the early 20th century. So, Seal receives a letter from Forbes that the colonial government had the funds to build an aquarium, and so he got started right away. First, the central location for the aquarium needed to be decided. Seal agreed that the bastion in front of the real gate of the city walls, Intramuros, this is the, the, the gate of, the, of Intramuros, and Intramuros is the old Spanish center of Manila, built in 1590. So this wall is like super old, and now they're going to put an aquarium within the wall. Um, Seal thought that, that the, 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 the gate of the city walls here, Intramuros, would provide the space access and cultural heritage distinct to colonial Manila. Given the unique design of Intramuros, the aquarium was constructed in the, quote, form of a tunnel 
with the exhibit tanks on the inner wall and light admitted from the opposite side, end quote. Still mapped out 26 tanks for reef food and poisonous fish found in Philippine waters and three large tanks for sharks, whales, and dugongs. A dugong is a kind of manatee that's local to, to that area. While spacious and historical, the location of the Manila Aquarium presented one inherent problem. In contrast to Till's experience at the, with the Honolulu Aquarium in 1904, which was established on the shores of Waikiki, the public aquarium built within the walled city of Intramuros was relatively distant from Manila Bay. And by the turn of the 20th century, this body of water, the Manila Bay, and the city's estuaries bore the cost of Manila's urban growth and industrial development. The location of the Manila Aquarium thus posed an important challenge to bringing the ocean ashore and keeping its fish fauna alive and radiant. So that is, Manila Bay was like totally polluted in the early 20th century. And they needed to go beyond the shore waters to bring fresh water in so that it could circulate in the aquarium. This was an obstacle faced not only by Manila, but also by public aquariums in Jakarta and Singapore. In explaining why Singapore's aquarium was proposed a mile from the sea and not at the waterfront, uh, waterfront of Teluk Air, one observer reported, suffice it, to, suffice it to say that the sea around this city is, is exceedingly polluted by sewage, shipping, factories, and so on. Consequently, a fish brought from the clean, clear depths off of Pahang or Tranganu, places off of Malaya, uh, Malaysia, would be exceedingly unhappy if placed in the turbid water of our busy seaport." End quote. What complicated the development of public aquariums in Southeast Asia and the Pacific was that their shore waters were unsuitable for maintaining the ocean and its aquatic life in the city. In search of a solution, Seal proposed the idea of a closed circulating system utilizing a combination of pumps and filtrations that would circulate fresh seawater hauled in from a great distance. So this is the view of the interior of the Manila Aquarium, and that's essentially the wall that they, that they um, put the tanks in. <clears throat> Just a few months before the start of World War I, the Manila Aquarium opened to the public on February 7, 1914. As souvenirs, the Bureau of Science prepared a series of colored postcards and a booklet of some of the most brilliant and curious Philippine fish. Built within the walls of the Real Gate, the aquarium's exhibition tanks were set in iron frames and kept lit with skylights that made for a, quote, a most satisfactory view of the fish, end quote. Electric lights were used, too, particularly for night displays. The mixture of the lights, tanks, pipes, and walls created a scientific spectacle that was unmatched in Asia and the Pacific and perhaps the world in 1914. Through the Manila Aquarium, still brought the ocean ashore and made its fauna more intimate and public. For the residents of the colonial city, seeing marine life up close was a new cultural experience, not only in the Philippines, but in the Pacific. As the first aquarium in the Western Pacific and outside of Japan, which had actually the earliest aquarium in 1888, Seal needed to capture and sustain the public's interest. Um, to these ends, he stocked the aquarium with, quote, curious and bright colored fish, sea anemones, crabs, sea urchins, starfish, and other representatives of the wonderful and interesting forms of marine life found in the tropical waters of the Philippine Islands. Outside of the main, the main tunnel, here's another shot of, of that aquarium, of the sort of laboratory. Outside of the main tunnel, there were large tanks that kept a variety of turtles and sharks. In 1915, the aquarium boasted a collection of 756 specimens representing 154 different kinds of fish. Reflecting the richness of Philippine seas and Philippine waters, the Manila Aquarium attracted 61,673 visitors from February to December in 1914. More than half of these visitors paid a mission to see the ocean and its wonders in the walled city, thus making this scientific institution self-supporting in its first year of operation. By 1917, the aquarium had acquired its first dugong from a lighthouse keeper on Corridor Island, just outside of Manila Bay. When delivering the dugong to the Bureau of Science officials gathered at the local pier, the keeper explained, quote, this fish eats more than a horse. It's kind of an interesting, so 
uh, if we think of what I'm trying to do here as a kind of form of environmental humanities, this is an, a really interesting sort of um, uh, quote because what the lighthouse keeper is observing, this fish eats more than a horse He's observing that the dugon is a, is a complete herbivore. And this is kind of new knowledge about, uh, about dugongs. There's very little known about them during the early 20th century. I mean, they weren't in captivity. This was one of the first places to have a dugong in captivity. But to know what it eats is an important part of keeping something alive in captivity. Um, so the fact that the lighthouse keeper said this, this kind of um, implies some, some really important baseline information about marine animals. With the division of fisheries organized and the aquarium established, Seal sought new opportunities back home in the U.S. and returned in 1917. After three years at Harvard, um, where he was uh, curator of fish for the Museum of Comparative Zoology, Seal looked west to California. From San Francisco, he would commence the final chapter in the arc of his life aquatic. And again, ooh, what's that? That's a blank page. And again, Jordan's connections were important but so too are Seal's ichthyological knowledge and aquarium expertise. So it's to the, to the last place that we'll go, that's to San Francisco. Seal's return to San Francisco in 1920 transformed the city by cultivating its place within the modern world of public aquariums. Fish were at the center of changing San Francisco in, in the 1920s and connecting it to the circuits of science, commerce, and fauna that were shaping the Pacific. Fish explained why Seal moved west and began to organize the Pacific Coast first public aquarium on the, under the auspices of the California Academy of Sciences. By 1920, Barton Everman was director of the Academy, a post he held from 1914 to 1932. But before becoming director, Everman was a young lecturer of ichthyology at Stanford. Recruited by David Starr Jordan um, uh, for the academic year 1891 to 1892. So basically, Everman and Still, they were classmates together. Um, they not only overlapped at Stanford, Everman and Still were also from Indiana, which, which was an important part of the personal relationship that they had. After Stanford, Everman joined the Fish Commission, later renamed the Bureau of Fisheries, and he held several important administrative posts from 1892 to 1894, including curator of fish at the U.S. National Museum. While the careers of Jordan, Everman, and Still arced in different directions in the early 20th century, they ultimately intersected in the Pacific and through Pacific fish. In 1901, Jordan and Everman surveyed the fish fauna of Hawaii, collecting a wealth of tropical species from, field, from the field and from public markets. In 1905, Jordan and Seal worked together on a new list of fish from um, Negros, an island in the Philippines. They named a new genius after uh, Castro de Alera, who was a Spanish ichthyologist in the 1880s who lived in Manila. In 1906, Everman and Seal produced a comprehensive catalog of Philippine fish derived from the collection of specimens used for the 1904 St. Louis Exposition. And in fact, the Everman and Seal comprehensive list of Philippine fish is really the first survey of fish species in the Philippines. The Spanish did sort of bits and pieces, but this was the kind of the first comprehensive one. Through a history of these personal ties and ichthyological connections, Jordan, Everman, and Seal shaped the production of knowledge about fish in the Pacific, but also ways of seeing this vast oceanic zone. In 1920, Everman recruited Seal to play a leading role in organizing a public aquarium that would bring together the Pacific's many diverse species under one institution. As director of the Academy of Sciences, Everman was in a unique position to realize such an institution because of the bequest of Ignaz Steinhardt a Bavarian-born banker who managed the Anglo-California Bank in San Francisco. Steinhardt passed away in 1917 and left $250,000 for the California Academy of Sciences to, quote, provide the citizens of San Francisco with an aquarium, end quote. And that's how it gets its name. With Seal as founding superintendent, the Steinhardt Aquarium was to be, quote, as fine and complete as anywhere in the world. Built within the grounds of Golden Gate Park, the Steinart Aquarium was some distance from the ocean, much like its counterpart in Manila. Based on his experience, Still was familiar with, the challenge, with this challenge and thus suggested the use of a closed circulating system. The engineers constructing the aquarium employed a series of reservoirs, pumps, and filters to ensure that fresh seawater was filtered through the aquarium's tanks, keeping the sea life healthy and also healthy looking for the public. 
and that's the shot of the aquarium. So you might notice that the Manila and the Steinart Aquarium have the same sort of tunnel um, design. The Pacific Coast's first public aquarium opened in San Francisco on September 29, 1923. For Jordan, who attended the dedication, the Steinhardt Aquarium was a remarkable scientific institution. It had the power to open the ocean to new publics and horizons. In his address, he offered a sense of this promise and future to the crowds that gathered for the dedication. He basically says that it, this can be a new laboratory for scientists all over the world to understand the fish from the Pacific. As the aquarium's founding superintendent, Seal had the crucial staff, task of sparking the public's interest in ocean life and sustaining it. Based on his knowledge, aquarium expertise, and field experience, Seal arranged the exhibits and selected the fauna to best showcase the brilliant colors of the Pacific. Working with 82 tanks, he committed 16 of the 57 tanks lining the main corridor to marine life from Hawaii. So this was called, not this particular hall, but a hall similar to this was called Hawaii Hall, which was stocked with Hawaii fish or Pacific fish. From these tanks, he warmed the seawater to replicate a habitat suitable for keeping tropical fish not only alive in the city, but also attractive for public viewing. Again, the aesthetics is, are sort of really important. In 1924, there were 226 tropical fish representing 51 species. As a collection, these fish constituted one of the most popular exhibits in the aquarium. Still added coral to these tropical tanks too. And this was completely new, to, to actually cultivate and keep coral. Through a partnership with Matson, the, the, the big shipping company that worked out of Hawaii, that connected essentially Hawaii to the West Coast, coral species and Hawaiian fish were transported in small glass aquariums built especially for supplying the Steinard Aquarium with Pacific life. Seal arranged for the Honolulu Aquarium to host a collection of fish before they crossed the Pacific to ensure that not only the strongest specimens made the journey, um, but that also in keeping live coral and reef fish in warm seawater tanks, Seal was pioneering a practice that continues to the present at the Steinard Aquarium and enables today's scientists, much like these two, um, or probably the one in the tank, I'm not sure if the guy with the mic is a scientist, but much like these scientists here, uh, to study the effects of climate change on coral environments and their rich reef fauna. So this is used to sort of study how climate change, how the warming of the water affect reefs and reef fish and coral. By reproducing this exceptional environment at the Steinard Aquarium, Seal was bringing the marine diversity of the Pacific to publics thousands of miles away. Like the Manila Aquarium, the Steinard Aquarium also maintained a well-equipped laboratory for biological and ichthyological research. Visiting scientists used the laboratory's microscopes and workstations. They also accessed the aquarium's photographic room that allowed researchers to document the specimens they, they examined. Illustrating the connectedness of the interwar Pacific, in 1925, Seal hosted Eogracias Vilidodid, uh, a young Filipino who took the train south to San Francisco, uh, excuse me, north to San Francisco to use the aquarium's laboratory and investigate a collection of fish. After completing his doctorate at Stanford in 1927, Dio returned to the Philippines where he became director of the Bureau of Fisheries during the Japanese occupation and upon independence established the country's first fisheries school in 1946. Seal also used the aquarium's laboratory to develop new insights into keeping tropical fish in the city. In 1924, he made a major discovery with regards to feeding aquarium fish um, that started when Seal was given a collection of small reddish shrimp secured from the brine ponds of San Mateo, which is there in the, the bay, a nearby town with salt flats across the bay from San Francisco. While the brine shrimp were excellent food fish, they were difficult to collect during the rainy season, rainy season and colder winter months. But their eggs, on the other hand, were abundant and accessible. Through a series of experiments conducted in the aquarium's laboratory, Seal learned that he could harvest brine shrimp after they had been collected, washed, dried, and stored in glass jars. He found that the eggs, if properly kept, were hatchable. 
Based on his experiments in using seawater, Seal had an 85% hatch rate. With such results, he concluded, quote, the young shrimp are a splendid food for all the young tropicals, end quote. Seal's work on the brine shrimp at the Steinhardt in the 20s and 30s radically increased the tropical fish food supply and thus the global growth of public aquariums and hobby aquarius, because then now there's a food supply to feed these fish. With a food supply that was cheap and abundant, more tropical fish could be kept in captivity. In this way, the Pacific was connected through Seal's work on brine shrimp eggs, um, much like the aquariums were doing through their institution. Seeing a new market open, Seal made vast quantities of these eggs available for purchase through the San Francisco Aquarium Society, which his wife, uh, Ethel, she was the editor of the, the journal that they published, which was called the Aquarium Journal. Finally, it was Seal's work at the Steinhardt that encompassed the entire Pacific and made its fish fauna a public attraction. And just three months after its opening in October to the end of December 1923, the aquarium welcomed approximately 550,000 visitors, an unprecedented public response. After this first year, the aquarium averaged about a million visitors, with most coming primarily to see the fish, end quote. In 1934, the Steinhardt Aquarium exhibited 11,676 fish, representing 413 species. By the end of World War II, the total number of visitors who walked through the halls of the Steinhardt Aquarium reached nearly excuse me, 25 million. Seal remained as part of the aquarium a constant place of wonder, profit, and science, and served as its superintendent until his retirement in late 1941. So in conclusion, from 1904 to 1941, SEAL engineered a network of public aquariums spanning the Pacific. These institutions and others like them brought the ocean ashore and made its fauna known to society, science, and commerce. At Honolulu, Manila, and San Francisco, millions of people made their way to the city to see nature and experience up close, which was a completely new experience. In Honolulu, the public marveled at the wonders of a giant squid. In Manila, school children witnessed the strangeness of a dugong, making it an abiding object of national affection and public protection. In San Francisco, residents were captivated by the brilliance of Pacific fish. At each of these aquariums, Seal also made fish collections and described new species, writing these tropical types into science. He used the aquariums as laboratories for fisheries development, too. In Manila, Seal inspected fish markets, compiling a list of commercial species in the process. He populated some of the Manila Aquarium's tanks with food fish in order to breed them in captivity for scientific observations, but also to improve their production. In San Francisco, Seal ensured that the Steinhardt Aquarium was built with a hatchery for the same economic purposes. More importantly, I think, the legacy of Seal's ichthyology and infrastructure I would argue, profoundly shaped the place of the Pacific within today's world of biological diversity and marine protection. Indeed, Seal's life aquatic, and the life aquatic of many others like him, laid the political groundwork for the designation of biological hotspots, such as the Coral Triangle, seen here, and the Papahanaumokuia National Marine Monument. In the case of the Coral Triangle, this hotspot which really overlaps with a lot of the areas that SEAL did work, um, is believed to be the world's epicenter of marine biological diversity. Stretching from the Solomons to, the, to Singapore, it has 72% of the world's coral reefs. It's home to 37% of the world's reef fish. More than 3,000 uh, fish species have been recorded from within the coral triangle alone. 27 marine mammal species, including sperm whales, blue whales, and orcas, exists within this area or pass through this area. Um, and the greatest extent and concentration of mangroves and seagrass um, are within that, that triangle as well. Likewise, and we go back to this picture, likewise, and circling back to, the, the, to, the, to this talk's introduction, we have the Papahanaumokea Marine National Monument, located within the waters, or within the wider North Hawaiian Islands. And while President Obama's 2016 proclamation transformed this monument into the largest ocean reserve in the world, measuring again almost 600,000 square miles, 
It was the work of ichthyology and infrastructure and the labors of ichthyologists such as Seal being done nearly 120 years earlier that seeded and supported not just the rise of biodiversity research, but also the politics for making protected spaces real. In conclusion, I'd like to suggest that Seal's Pacific career, I'd like to suggest that Seal's Pacific career shows us how ocean history and the environmental humanities more broadly can play a critical role not only in knowing the past, but also, and I think more importantly, in understanding how the present came to be. Indeed, through this paper or through this talk, I've sought to surface how fish and aquariums and scientists who deal with both were central to grasping the Pacific's biological diversity in the arc of empire and remain vital to understanding as well as preserving this great ocean in the age of climate change and perhaps even more dire in a time of Trump. Thank you. We have any questions? Hi. Um, so it seems like, like I'm fully convinced that SEAL played a big role in kind of, as you say, bringing the ocean to land, right? Making people aware of what was out there. Yeah. Um, but it seems to me that there's kind of a leap from that to convincing everyone that we should have large-scale co conserved areas, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you know that you mentioned that they, they they were aware of the pollution in the water and whatever. But I'm kind of curious when you were walking through these old aquariums. Yeah. Was there, as there is today, such a focus on conservation? Because in the New England Aquarium, for instance, you're going to see 50% of all of the boards are going to be about how the ocean is dying, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So I just wonder what was Seal's you know take on designing these aquariums in a way that convinced people to protect these oceans. Okay, good, excellent question. And you're right. The sort of, the, there is a massive leap from, say, 1940 to where we are today, to the aquarium's agenda of today. I mean, a good example of that is Woods Hole, in probably the last three years, only shifted its attention to climate change, where it really started to brand itself as, like, we are the center of research about the ocean in the age of climate change. So that's a real recent thing. But I think... Are there seeds? Can we find seeds in the work that SEAL was doing that sort of maybe in a tighter way informs what we're seeing today? And I think there are. Um, so these aquariums were really about displaying local diversity, regional diversity, thinking about the Pacific in a kind of regional way. Um, but they were also about recognizing the impact of fishing, not so much pollution on, on the water, but the impact of fishing on certain populations. And I think that's where SEAL's work kind of comes into play, but more, probably more directly, because conservation was still a somewhat um, not fully formed concept, I'd say, in the early 20th century in terms of the marine environment. Everman, uh, who SEAL worked with, I think it was in 1921, wrote a paper about protection in the Pacific. So there was a group called the Pacific Science Congress that was founded in Hawaii. Jordan was very much a part of it. Um, Everman, Everman uh, advocated for the protection of marine mammals largely because he saw Japanese whaling as really kind of being detrimental to, to, the, to the life of the Pacific. But going back to steel, what I would say is this. Um, I think the line is clear in terms of if we look at the base knowledge that he's creating. He's, he's documenting in some ways, in some fashion, kind of the first sense of reef diversity. And, and it's that base knowledge that's used today to make cases for the protection of areas. We know that this place is rich in, in, in biological diversity because of people like Seal and many, many others. And of course, interactions with local Hawaiians and and, and, and Japanese scientists during the early 20th century. But that baseline knowledge allows for places like the Steinhardt today, um, the New England Aquarium today, to have programs that advocate for uh, this kind of dying ocean and we need to protect it. 
Yeah. So I don't think the ocean was dying back then, but it was, they were building that baseline knowledge that's now being activated to support those efforts. So thank you. Thank you for an excellent talk. And uh, my question has to do with introducing species yeah. and whether they but he lived long enough to see the negative impacts, as I don't think you can find any native Hawaiian fishes in any of those rivers now? Um, well, the, the... Maybe a few? Probably. But the minnows that were introduced, I'll get to a fish that actually was way worse than the, than the minnow. The minnow was introduced in 1905 in what were called the alawais. These are kind of water canals. Um, and that's because these were stagnant water that were breeding mosquitoes, and they wanted to, to fight that. Seal did see the effects, the adverse effects of introduced fish populations, um, because he, he died in 1958. And really, the worst fish that was introduced anywhere, uh, I would say, um, has an, a sort of Southeast Asia Pacific story, and Hawaii is very much part of it, and that's tilapia. Tilapia today, are in Hawaii, and that's what consumes a lot of the vegetation. And tilapia, why they're so bad for native fish populations is because they colonize the breeding grounds of where native fish breed. So they squeeze out local fish, and therefore local fish aren't able to kind of um, repopulate. Tilapia starts in Africa. It's randomly discovered by again, a guy named Haji Mojair in Indonesia in 1936. Um, he starts to farm it. World War II brings the Japanese to Southeast Asia. It goes to Singapore with the Japanese where it's introduced as a food fish. And then in 1951, Dio Gracias, the guy that Seal had met in Palo Alto and San Francisco, Dio Gracias is director of fisheries in the Philippines. He goes to Jakarta and brings the tilapia back to the Philippines and introduces it also as a food fish. From Manila, it goes to the South Pacific and Hawaii. So it, it, this tilapia fish sort of expands over Asia and the Pacific and is touted in the 50s as a great form of, of kind of food security. It's a great source of food security for, for developing and sort of semi-developing countries and areas. But it quickly becomes disastrous when it, it starts to crowd out and um, push out local fish diversity. So he did got to see that a bit. Whether he was attuned to it, I don't know. But so, so I actually had almost exactly the same question because I'm really curious about all this, the introduction of these fish. And so when you look back at who's writing about seal, yeah, and you look at the body of literature on that, what percentage of them are talking about him as a, the father of aquariums and, and sort of conservation? And how many of them are saying um, he is actually one of the many people who didn't really understand the dangers of in introducing exotic animals yeah. um, into far off places. He, he was not alone in those days, but what, what, what's, his, what's his reputation sort of up from his death on? Yeah. It's an interesting reputation because it's largely n overlooked or forgotten. I mean, he's not really remembered, uh, is a sad thing. Um, so he had, he had spent time at Harvard, um, but Harvard's got like uh, basically a few things that he's written, but there's very few books written about him. I don't know any book actually written about him. Uh, so I think he's overlooked, much like, I would say, much like the, the history of introduced fish species. Um, it's also overlooked. It's not something that we pay much attention to. Um, and much like, I think, this history of sort of looking at when does that baseline knowledge get sort of developed. But I think it's important to sort of think of SEAL in these complicated terms, both as one who builds knowledge, but also really changes environment through his, his kind of his, his food work. We have time for one more. Question. Sure. Yeah. So I, I want to start with the picture you showed at the beginning. You showed the striking fact that there were many female marine biologists. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a great So picture. it made me wonder, what were their impact in the early conservation efforts? Hmm. Of, of the women scientists? Yes, so there are quite a few. So yeah. what, what was her role in conservation in that time? 
Oh, that's a, you know, I'm going to have to say I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that one. But um, there's a book written about this laboratory that I'm sure covers it. Um, the study of women in science is, the history, rather, the history of science, women in the history of science is, is a kind of, I think, a really important and growing field. And a lot of folks are going to marine biology because that was a big area for, for women in the late 19th century. I couldn't say what their role was in conservation. Though I would say, my guess would be, I mean, the marine, this kind of central part of California, the, um, the Monterey Bay area, has a huge aquarium. And it's right beside Pacific Grove. I would guess that... Um, but the women that were involved in sort of the work of the laboratory must have had some uh, connection with the aquarium and the general conservation of the, the Monterey Bay um, when it was created, I think, in the 60s and 70s. I think that's a sustained interest for sure. Um, but I couldn't say for certain during this time what their role was. Because sadly, sorry? Yes. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful point. Carson was at Woods Hole, who studied at Johns Hopkins, who worked for the Bureau of Fisheries, um, who had communication with people in the Philippines because she worked for the Office of Foreign Assistance. Um, before she shifted to Silent Spring, she was all about fish. Um, she's got three great beautiful books that talk about sort of seeing marine life through the eyes of a mackerel, for instance, through the eyes of a fish. I mean, she... I think that's an excellent point, but the thing is that her... Aquatic life is completely overlooked or forgotten as well. She's more known for pesticides um, and, and kind of the, the land focus. And I think, I think it's important, perhaps you all in this room could pick this story up. I mean, there's, there's people there. I mean, I'd say at least half of the, the, the scientists present are women. Uh, their stories definitely need to be told and, and remembered. So, yeah. Thank you, Anthony, very much. Let's give him a hand. <laughs> Come get a flyer from me if you're interested in the conference. <laughs>